Hi everyone, this lesson is on the eye condition known as ptosis. So we're going to talk about some of the eye anatomy to better understand why it happens. We'll also talk about many causes and we'll talk about how it is treated. So ptosis is an ophthalmological condition, so it's an eye condition involving drooping of the upper eyelid. So it's a drooping of the upper eyelid and it may be unilateral or bilateral, so it can be one-sided or both-sided. And it's also known as blepharotosis. So the prefix blepharo refers to the eyelid. So here are some images of what ptosis looks like. So you can see in this image here, this is a unilateral ptosis, and this is actually a bilateral ptosis with one side more severe. So most of the time, ptosis is going to be more a cosmetic issue, but it can cause mild to severe vision impairment or vision blurriness. Let's talk about the anatomy of the eye to better understand why ptosis occurs. So there's important muscles above the eye that help to open the eyelid and allow it to close. One of them is known as the levator palpebrae superioris, which we just refer to as the levator muscle. There's then something called a levator epineurosis. This connects the levator muscle to the tarsus, and the tarsus, or the superior tarsus more specifically, is a dense connective tissue that forms the structure of the upper eyelid. There's also another muscle here as well known as the superior tarsal muscle. It's also known as Mueller's muscle, and it adjoins to the superior tarsus as well. And the levator palpebrae superioris muscle is a striated muscle that's innervated by the oculomotor nerve, which is the name for cranial nerve 3. And superior tarsal muscle is itself a smooth muscle that is under the control of the sympathetic nervous system. So let's talk about how we actually distinguish ptosis and determine its cause. So we break down the causes of ptosis into congenital and acquired. So congenital ptosis is going to be something that's present at birth. It's going to be the most common type overall. So out of all types of ptosis, congenital ptosis is actually the most common type. And it's more likely in male patients. And more specifically, congenital ptosis is caused by levator muscle dystrophy. And there's a particular clinical finding with regards to congenital ptosis, and that is that it has no upper eyelid crease. So that is a finding in congenital ptosis. Now with regards to acquired ptosis, it is something that we're not born with, but it occurs later on in life. And there are actually various subtypes of acquired ptosis. These include aberneurotic, neurogenic, myogenic, mechanical, traumatic, and medications-induced ptosis. We're going to talk about all these in more detail later on. And with regards to the various subtypes, Abraneurotic is the most common type of acquired ptosis, which often occurs in adulthood and also in late life as well. Now let's talk about the different categories of causes of acquired ptosis. So the first category, again, is going to be aponeurotic. So aponeurotic, again, is the most common type of acquired ptosis. So in aponeurotic ptosis, this is going to be due to involutional changes, dehiscence, or disinsertion, which leads to defective functioning of the levator aponeurosis. So we talked about the levator aponeurosis before that connects the levator muscle to the superior tarsus. So in aponeurotic ptosis, we're going to have issues at the levator aponeurosis. So we can see issues with involutional changes. Involutional means a shrinking. So there's a shrinking of the structure. There can also be dehiscence or a pulling away or separation. So all of these can weaken the levator muscle attaching to the superior tarsus through the levator aponeurosis. Now some of the important causes of aponeurotic ptosis is older age. So as we get older, the levator aponeurosis can be shrunk and there can be issues with the structure of the muscle as well. Trauma is also another cause. If you had your eye struck or were struck in the eye, this can cause issues with the anatomical structure of the aponeurosis. Long-term contact lens use is also another important cause of aponeurotic ptosis. So we can imagine if you have contact lenses, you're going to have this lens on the eye. So it's going to be over the eye. And then every time you blink, especially if it's a dry contact lens, the eyelid is going to rub against that dry contact lens. And that's going to essentially weaken the levator aponeurosis. We can also see it from frequent eye rubbing. Again, if you're having a lot of movement and rubbing on that area that can weaken the levator aponeurosis. And related to this is chronic inflammation. If they have atopic triad, if they have allergic rhinitis, for instance, they may have swollen eyelids and then they may be rubbing their eyes a lot. That's often a cause of aponeurotic ptosis. And then surgery, post-surgical changes can also cause this as well. In the category of neurogenic ptosis, 
This is going to be due to a disrupted innervation of the levator muscle, and likewise it can be due to a disruption of the sympathetic input to the Mueller's muscle. So some of the causes here include Horner syndrome. So Horner syndrome is due to a compression on the sympathetic chain. This is going to lead to issues with Mueller's muscle especially. Cranial nerve 3 palsy, we talked about cranial nerve 3 or the oculomotor nerve innervating the levator muscle. So if we have a CN3 palsy, this is going to be a cause. And then multiple sclerosis is also another important cause as well. And I also want to mention that these particular causes can cause other associated signs and symptoms along with ptosis. So in Horner syndrome, we may have ptosis, but we can also have meiosis as well. Meiosis is going to be a constricted pupil or a smaller diameter pupil compared to the other side. So on the side where we have ptosis, we can also have a smaller pupil than the other side, and that can cause anisocoria. Anisocoria is going to be differences in size of pupils. With regards to cranial nerve 3 palsy, we can have a dilated pupil. So on the side with ptosis, the pupil is going to be dilated. This is what we call midriasis. So this can happen in cranial nerve 3 palsy. And then multiple sclerosis can have multiple other neurological findings, and one of them can be vision loss. So these are some things to think about when we see ptosis. In the category of myogenic ptosis, myogenic is going to be referring to the muscle, and more specifically, it's going to be myopathy of the levator muscle. Some of the causes here include ocular myopathy, myotonic dystrophy, myasthenia gravis, and blepharophimosis syndrome. And the one cause I want to point out here is myasthenia gravis. So myasthenia gravis can be categorized in either neurogenic or myogenic categories. And in myasthenia gravis, there are production of autoantibodies against acetylcholine receptors. So it's antibodies against our own acetylcholine receptors. So it's an autoimmune condition. So Oftentimes, there's going to be other associated symptoms with myasthenia gravis, so there can be muscle weakness after prolonged use, but we may only have an ocular myasthenia gravis. It might only affect the eyes, and there may only be ptosis. So what we can see with ptosis in myasthenia gravis is that in patients who have ptosis due to myasthenia gravis, when they first wake up, they may not have ptosis at all. The muscle hasn't been fatigued, but over time, over the course of the day, due to excessive blinking, the muscles can fatigue, the acetylcholine release is reduced and the competitive action on the acetylcholine receptor essentially blocks the proper contraction of the levator muscle leading to ptosis. So we can see no ptosis in the morning and ptosis later on in the day. So that's something I also want to mention as well. Now the other categories of acquired ptosis are mechanical. So mechanical ptosis is where there's some mass that is causing issues with the levator muscle functioning. So it essentially leads to the inability to completely open the eyes. So is hard as you try, you may not be able to open your eyes completely. Some of these causes include scar tissue, a neoplasm or a small tumor, neurofibromas, hemangiomas, chalazion, and foreign bodies. In the category of traumatic, this is due to a transection of the levator muscle. So if there's some major trauma to the eye and eyelid, it can cut through the levator muscle and you won't be able to use it. So you're going to have a drooping eyelid due to that. So some eyelid the laceration or some other injury to the eyelid. And in the category of medications and drugs, the medications and drugs all have different pathophysiological mechanisms. Some of the medications that can cause ptosis include pregabalin, Botox, opioids like morphine and hydrocodone, and illicit drug use like heroin. Now let's talk about how we diagnose and treat ptosis. So oftentimes ptosis is going to be a clinical finding of some other underlying condition. So oftentimes the diagnostic methods are going to depend on the suspected underlying cause. So this can include blood work or imaging. So if we have some suspicion of myasthenia gravis, it's going to be important to look for acetylcholine receptor antibodies and antistriated muscle antibody as well. And if the acetylcholine receptor antibody is negative, we can look for muscle-specific tyrosine kinase. So those can all be helpful in looking for myasthenia gravis if that is the suspected cause. And imaging can be important, especially if there are other neurological findings this can help find a neoplasm or any changes that we may see with multiple sclerosis, for instance. And eye examination can be performed as well. This includes an assessment of the levator muscle functioning, margin reflex distance, palpebral fissure height, and margin crease distance. And one other test I want to mention here, again, has to do with myasthenia gravis, and that is the ICE test. So the ICE test is performed as follows. We first want to measure the ptosis, so to see how much drooping there is. And once we've measured it, what we want to do is we want to take a pack of ice or some ice compress and put it on the eyelid that is affected with ptosis and leave it there for two minutes. After that, we take the ice off 
And if the totic eyelid is not as drooping as before, if it has been raised up at least two millimeters, that is a positive test, and that is a potential finding of ptosis due to Mycenae gravis. So when we've figured out the different causes of ptosis, what do we do for treatment? So treatment depends on the underlying cause. If it is one of those other causes that can be treated medically, that can help with ptosis. Another possible treatment is what we call oxymetazoline ophthalmic solution. This has been shown in clinical trials to improve ptosis, so the totic eyelid can be lifted up more. And then another possible non-surgical treatment is glasses crutches. So glasses crutches are going to be a modification to the frame of your glasses to help with ptosis. And then there's also surgery as well. Surgery can be a treatment for ptosis. So there's multiple surgical methods. These include frontalis sling, levator resection and advancement, blepharoplasty, so essentially just cutting the eyelid. If it's very droopy, especially in older patients, this can be something that is performed. And Mueller's muscle resection. All of these are potential surgeries for treating ptosis. Please check out my lesson on cataracts and retinal detachment. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.